Good morning. My name is Lucy, and I'm grateful to the Lord to be here this morning to share my life, to share my testimony, to share what God has done in my life. I'm here with my husband, Ian Chikoti. We are both from Zambia, and we are just grateful to the Lord to be here. We are thankful to the pastors, Mark and Sharon, for allowing us to just be here and share this time with you. We pray that as we go along, you'll be blessed, because we have been blessed as well. As I said, my name is Lucy, and I'm from Zambia. I came to know the Lord some time ago in 1974, to be precise. It was a dramatic way in which I came to know the Lord. That is a story for another time. But I've enjoyed saving the Lord from 1980 when I was ordained as a minister of the gospel. And I've served the Lord in various ways in many areas. I've worked in churches, in universities, and colleges. In the church, I've been preaching, teaching, training people just to get to love the Lord. And that's one thing that I love doing. And that's what just makes my life tick. That's why I'm here today. Apart from that, I have taught amongst the youths, just training them into leadership. I've traveled all over Africa and part, partly in Europe where I was trained as well. I got my training in theology in Zambia and in the UK. All this has been to just be able to divide the word of God to the people that I preach, to the people that God brings closer to me. As I said, this is what I love doing. 10 years ago, the Lord helped me to start a mission amongst uh, men and women who have been infected and affected with HIV and AIDS. And this was just caregiving, support, and uh, uh, just taking care of them and giving them food and just being, help, being able to help them through the situation. Today we are battling uh, COVID. In Zambia, it's COVID and HIV and AIDS, which has been in churches and just among us the communities. So it was a joy for me just to be able to be there give the psychosocial counseling and help out the people. And what am I doing here in the United States today? A year ago, uh, we had been praying, prior to that, two years back, we had been praying that the Lord would be able to send us into the ends of the world to preach the gospel, because we have been church planters and adopting and, and just building churches. So we thought it would be a good, idea, a good idea, and the Lord laid this burden upon our hearts to come over to the United States. But I couldn't come over to the United States with my husband at that particular time a year ago. My husband traveled alone to come to a conference. On his way out to go to Zambia, he fell ill. And upon that, he was in the hospital for some time. And uh, I was called to the United States, and that's a year now. I've been here. Uh, it's amazing. I can't even believe I've been here for a year. But we've been here for a year, and uh, we've been taken care of by our wonderful friends that have been here and just nurturing us until my husband is able to, to walk and be able to do things again. Upon realizing and looking at all these things, we realized we had been praying for two years that we may go to the ends of the world. And it was a scary vision. But today, looking back, I can say, was this what it meant to come to the ends of the world? Is Donora, Monongahela, and Sharoy the ends of the world? We believe we are at the end of the world. And we believe this is a season in which God has called us to be able to participate in bringing men and women to the Lord and just being available to his service. Having said that, I don't want to take up all the time. I'll give it up to my 
husband to bring the word to you and what the Lord has laid upon his heart to share with us. My name is Ian Chikoti. Ian Chikoti, a good name. And um, she has said some things. I would rather also add some things about myself before I bring you the word. First of all, I was brought up in a Christian home. My parents were Christians, wonderful church planters, and uh, uniquely in their own rights, they served the Lord from 1944 up to 1999. And uh, upon completing school, I now realized and then that I was in a Christian home doing religious activities. In school, I was the chairman for scripture union. I was singing in the school choir and church choirs. And I was just doing fine as a child of an evangelist. And having from Christian home, I thought I was a Christian, but really, God visited me in 1977 when I had the claims of Christ in a very authentic way from the Word of God, when they started discipling me, and now I became a disciple of Jesus Christ. At that point, I call it my turning point. All the fears of darkness disappeared out of my life because I was very fearful. And also the fear of eternal fire disappeared. And now I embraced God as my Father, Jesus as my Savior, and the Holy Spirit as my Comforter to guide me, to lead me, in the way that I should go. After school, I got married to a wonderful lady here with a big deal and a better deal, I tell you. God blessed us with two biological children. And then uh, because of the state of affairs in Zambia, in my country, a lot of problems just like anywhere else, we had a lot of children who were not cared for. So we had to adopt children, we had to foster children, and somehow just come in and go out. So all in all, we adopted and fostered 23 children, and we have lots and lots of grandchildren, countless. I don't even know their names. But all this was what God was doing in, an, in our early marriage and in our marriage life. The other deal that I appreciate from my wife, that together we, ha we prayed to have children that will be an example to other children. And uh, our two biological children have done very well. They are married and uh, one has four children, and we are very grateful to the Lord and our God. Coming in the ministry in 1976, at my turning point, when I realized the authenticity of Jesus Christ as a Savior, he also taught me through his word, through his servants, that I had the ministry of reconciliation, even having seen it from my parents, that they were in planting churches. And then something was revealed to me, that I was prayed for to be in the church. At this point, I've worked in the secular world for about three years. Now they told me three other children died before me. And I was prayed for that if I lived, I will be in the church to serve Jesus Christ. When that was given to me, like Jonah, 
vomited on the shores of Nineveh uh, to go straight into the ministry. And today, I'm a church planter. I thank God that my wife and I together, we've planted, adopted, and we've networked with over 62 churches, 62 local churches that we can name by name. And we praise God because it has been all the grace of God. She has told you about the vision, how we came to America. But I also want to say that uh, I had a lot of plans in my life, a lot of goals in my life. And in these goals, some of the eminent ones that I see pretty eminent is where I purposed it in my life to pray, read the word of God on my knees. That transformed my life. And not only praying and reading the word of God on my knees, but also I started developing and started seeing that in planting churches, I was not just planting churches, but I had love for the men and women. Sometimes I would even cry as I prayed for them. And this has transformed me in the ministry. Just like our Lord Jesus Christ, his accession in uh, Isaiah 61, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Jesus read that scripture from Isaiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. I believe the Spirit of the Lord is upon me and upon my wife, Lucy. And together, we are attested and sent to preach the gospel to the poor. We preached in cities, in townships, and village to village, not only in Zambia, but in the Commonwealth countries and the foreign countries. He has also sent us to heal the sick. Every time we've gone into villages, there are no health centers. People looked to us. Sometimes we would go with a nurse or a male nurse or a nurse so that they can give out some off-counter medicines to help them recover. Others, we prayed for them, and we saw the hand of God. Not only that, but also God has called us to set the captives free, those who are bound, those who are opposed or praised by the evil one, we've ministered to them the word of the Lord. I didn't give you much more of what the Lord has done in my life and how the Lord has used us. But allow me at this moment that I share with you from the word of God, from Matthew chapter 22. Matthew 22, and uh, I would have loved to ask uh, Lucy to read the whole passage, but she's just going to read the short passage, verses 9 to 14. Verses 9 to 14. Matthew 22, 9 to 14. It's the parable of our Lord Jesus Christ. This will help us to see where we are coming from and what we are talking about. Let me just say this. I'm only going to pick up two things, to highlight two things from this passage. Matthew 9. Matthew 22. Matthew 22. Matthew 22, 9 to 14. 
powerful parable. This is 9 to 14 only. Would have loved to read all of it, but in your own time, read the whole passage and see what it's all about. Matthew 22, verses 9 to 14. Matthew 22, verses 9 to 14. So go to the main highways that lead out of the city and invite the wedding feast as many as you find. Those servants went out into the streets and gathered together all the people they could find, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to see the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed appropriately in wedding clothes. And he said, friend, how did you come in here without wearing the wedding clothes? And the man was speechless and without excuse. Then the king said to the attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him into the darkness outside. In that place, there will be weeping over sorrow and pain and grinding of teeth over distress and anger. For many are called, invited, but few are chosen. Amen. Let's say amen to the reading of the word of God. I wished I'd preached, but let me just share two great nuggets from this passage. In understanding this passage, you have to see that this is symbolic. It is metaphor. Jesus is just using this parable. You will see when you read the whole passage that the king is God. The son is Jesus. The invited guests are the people of Israel. The man without the white robe is the symbol of a man who is not saved, without salvation. With that, let's take the first nugget. We must be going to them. Church, and those of you listening, we must be going to where sinners are. You tell me it's difficult. You tell me there is COVID-19. You tell me the weather is bad. But still more, the command from the Savior says, go. Go and preach the gospel. When we go to them, we're going to find out that God is ready to save them. Some of them, they are ready to receive the word of salvation, just as we received the word of salvation, just as you received the word of salvation. We go and warn them concerning the wrath of God. God is love, very true, but also is the God of wrath is God who would punish those who do not believe in the gospel. Therefore, we need to go and preach the gospel. In our going to them, we're going to find out that people are dying without God. They are hopeless and helpless. You can see even currently in our neighborhood, some, some of them are our beloved ones. They've died of the disease, of the pandemic, and they have really gone, some of them, without Christ. We need to rise up and preach the gospel to the people where they are. 
The second gadget is that we must be gathering them. Not only we go to them and preach, they must be gathered. They must be brought to a place. They must be brought as it is in the parable to the wedding hall. There they will be sorted out. There they will be cleaned up. You see, when we go in the byways and highways, we'll find different type of people. Typical of sinners. All sinners. It doesn't matter how you can label them. We have a motto. Bring them in. Bad and good or good and bad. It's not our responsibility to tell them you are bad so you can't come to church. It's our responsibility to tell them you need Jesus. And that's the gospel. They need to hear the good news because already they know their status is bad. We need to cushion that with the good news that Jesus saves and satisfies. When we gather them, that's when we disciple them. When we disciple them, that's when they mature to be Christians. You see, Paul says, we preach Christ and present him to him, to you, so that you can mature. We can't disciple people who are not in church. We can only disciple people who are in church. In Zambia, we thank God that we have established a church which, by the grace of God, we founded, planted, established the leadership. But one of the things that we saw in there is that it was not racial. It was multi-ethnic. It was multi-linguistic. It was multi-gender. It was multi-generation. All the multis that you will think of. Tribes. Uh, we had Europeans, Americans, South Africans, and so on and so forth. That's church. And that's what we need wherever we are, wherever we go. We need a church that embraces all. I think at the moment we're not seeing church as it's supposed to be because we build walls around ourselves. We become introverts and we don't open up for others to come. We must open up. When you are discipled, you're going to be different. Five things before I close. Number one, you're going to be faithful as a disciple. Number two, you're going to be available as a disciple. Number three, you're going to be capable as a disciple. And number four, you're going to be teachable as a disciple. And number five, you're going to be spiritual. That's when you become spiritual, when you are discipled. If you are not a disciple, you remain a canon. You might raise a question, and you're welcome to ask that question. What can I do, testifier? What do you want me to do? Four things. Number one, start praying that you return to your first love. The first time you are born again, you are sharing your life to everybody. Number two, start reading the word of God that God may speak to you because God is speaking. Number three, watch out for the pastors when they call for your involvement. And when you are involved, you will say, how can I be involved? Three things. You can be involved by prayer, by financial support, 
and by involving yourself personally. With this, the parable to us would say, let's go out, church. Let's go out, my listeners, and bring them in. That's the whole message. Let's bring them in, bad or good. Let's go to them and let us gather them in Jesus' name. God bless you. Amen.